Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today, we are taking a more in-depth look at Clock for Clock, or IPC testing of Intel's LGA 1700 processors. So the 12th, 13th, and new 14th gen models. And we do this because it helps give some insight into the architectural or lack of architectural improvements Intel has made with each new generation. But before we do, Today's video is sponsored by ASUS and their excellent ROG Swift OLED PG27 AQDM gaming monitor. In our testing, we found the PG27 AQDM to be the best 27-inch 1440p 240Hz OLED monitor on the market. Not only does it feature the excellent black levels, lightning fast response times, and per pixel local dimming that we've come to love from OLED, but it's also the brightest model for HDR gaming with this panel that we've seen yet. This is a truly excellent display that delivers speed and motion clarity for multiplayer gaming, as well as stunning HDR visuals for single player gaming all in the one package. To learn more about the ASUS PG27 AQDM, click the link in the description below. Okay, so right away, it is worth noting that it's quite unusual that we get three generations or series of Intel CPUs on the same platform. Traditionally, Intel has only supported two series, and for a long time, this was part of their TikTok strategy. Sadly though, while Intel has a strong record of creating CPUs that offer excellent gaming performance, they also have a track record of terrible platform support. And by that I mean gamers have become accustomed to upgrading their perfectly good motherboard every time they want more CPU performance. And for a long time now, Intel's gotten away with this strategy, purely down to the fact that they lacked any real competition. We're all painfully aware that for the decade predating the release of Ryzen, AMD was in a death spiral, and even then it took a few generations for Ryzen to stem the bleeding. Fast forward to today though, and it's a completely different story. Intel's been getting battered in the retail markets, and despite the release of the 14th gen Raptor Lake refresh CPUs, things only look to be getting worse for Intel. And there are numerous reasons for why this is, and we believe one of the biggest contributing factors, other than the obvious excellent price to performance that many Ryzen processors have delivered over the years, is platform support. It's undeniable that AM4 was a massive success, and although AMD did their best to mess it up by announcing that they would be axing support prematurely, the enthusiast community saved AMD from AMDing themselves and in the process, helped to create what is now one of the best CPU platforms that has ever existed. Now, realizing this, AMD was quick to announce broad platform support for AM5, though they have left the door open to bail on the platform earlier than they did with AM4, so it's unclear if AM5 will be as successful as AM4, but one thing's clear, it's going to be worlds more successful than Intel's current LJ1700 platform, which is now effectively dead, despite the recent arrival of the new 14th generation models. In many ways, you could argue that the LJ1700 platform peaked with the initial release of the 12th gen Elder Lake architecture back in January of 2022. That said, the 13th gen Raptor Lake update was decent, increasing L2 and L3 cache capacities and boosting clock speeds for a small performance improvement, but ultimately it was just that, and certainly not enough to entice 12th gen owners to upgrade. Generally speaking though, you could overclock your 12th gen part to match the operating frequencies of 13th gen models, and doing so would further minimise the difference between the two. And that being the case, we've decided to eliminate the clock speed differences to see just how different 12th, 13th and 14th gen k skew parts are when operating at the same frequency. For this testing, the e-cores have been disabled and the ring bus has been locked at 3 GHz, and all CPUs have been tested with DDR5 7200 memory and the GeForce RTX 4090. So let's see how they compare. First up, we have the Cinebench multi-core benchmark, and here we find just a 3% increase from the 12900K to the 14900K when comparing the clock for clock performance. The margin is slightly smaller for the Core i7s, just a 2% increase from the 12th to 14th gen model, and then a 1% increase for the 14600K over the 12600K. The single core gains are, well, they're zero. There's nothing to talk about here. The cache benefits of the Raptor Lake architecture aren't particularly useful in this example, so we're looking at the same performance from the i5s to the i9s, and the generation really doesn't matter. Now, as we saw in the Cinebench multi-core test, using Blender shows almost no difference in performance between the Core i7-12700K and Core i9-14900K, as both CPUs pack 8 p-cores. We're looking at just a mere 2% difference in that matchup. 
Now, when it comes to gaming, we're looking at similar performance trends to what we're seeing in Blender and the Cinebench multi-core test. And that's to say, when operating at the same clock speeds, the 14900K, it's just 3% faster than the 12700K. And this is seen in Cyberpunk at 1080p using an RTX 4090. Out of interest, I did record the average total system power consumption during our benchmark pass, and I'm reporting the average from three runs here. Now for this testing, the voltages were not controlled, though all CPUs were tested on the same motherboard with the same BIOS revision. And it's quite clear based on this and past data that Raptor Lake is more power efficient than Elder Lake, though overall power usage is still very poor. Next up we have Starfield, and here we're seeing just a 5% increase from the Core i5-13600K to the Core i9-14900K, and that means the 14900K was just 3% faster than the 12900K. We're also seeing just a 3% uplift from the 12700K to the 14700K, though we did see a more sustainable 6% increase from the 12600K to the 14600K. The power consumption figures are similar to what we saw in Cyberpunk. The 14th gen is typically a bit better than 13th gen, either through silicon quality or some BIOS optimizations for the 14th gen parts. We haven't looked too closely at that yet, but both 13th and 14th gen are an improvement over the original 12th gen. Then finally we have Baldur's Gate 3, and here the 14900K was just 6% faster than the 12900K and 2% faster than the 13900K. Now the 14900K and 13900K are meant to be the same product, or they are the same product, yet the 14th gen version was consistently faster in our testing, at least this test and some of the game tests. So there is some kind of optimization taking place at the BIOS level, which will require further investigation. Still, the gains for the 14th gen parts over the older 12th gen models, not exactly significant. And here's the Baldur's Gate 3 total system power consumption figures, and again, they're quite similar to what we saw in Starfield and Cyberpunk, suggesting that some voltage optimization work has been done with each generation. So there you have it. Not a lot of progress from Intel over the past two years, despite appearing to have released three new generations of CPUs. And this in itself, it's not a big problem for Intel, as they're still very competitive in terms of performance, and in fact they often offer a higher level of performance than AMD, though at the cost of significantly higher power draw. What could be a big problem for Intel is their lack of platform commitment, and in fact this has likely been a real problem for some years now, resulting in a loss of sales. For example, had you purchased a 12th gen part like the Core i7-12700K, a CPU that we really liked and did recommend, you've really got nowhere to go from here. The 14900K, it's barely any faster, it is a very minor upgrade at best for what is a rather substantial financial investment. So best case really, Intel's 15th generation needs to offer a nice performance uplift, and that would allow you to upgrade to that, which would require a new motherboard. And decent Z790 motherboards, they start at around $200 US. So if you're not able to easily repurpose that system or sell it on, you're faced with quite a hefty financial loss there, and that's just to upgrade your CPU. It's really not a good situation for Intel buyers, and while I'm sure some will claim that it's a non-issue as no one upgrades every generation, that's not really the point. And really, no enthusiast or no customer should be defending Intel's poor platform support. You're just shooting yourself in the foot and making the PC platform worse for everyone else in the process. And this, in my opinion, is one of the worst aspects of the PC enthusiast crowd, and we sort of see this illogical corporate simping for not just Intel, but also AMD and Nvidia. On that note, Tim and I recently discussed this on our podcast surrounding our negative coverage of AMD's half-baked FSR3 technology and the disastrous release of Anti-Lag Plus, which resulted in some gamers getting banned from their favorite games. It's also true that people who buy Core i9s are more likely to upgrade more often, especially if that upgrade offers a reasonable performance advantage. So not the 13900K to the 14900K then, but the 10900K or 11900K up to the 13900K then sure. I think many high-end users would make that upgrade, and sadly though, it does require a new motherboard. It's a lot like RTX 4090 buyers. Many of them will be buying an RTX 5090 when that comes out, but those who purchased, say, an RTX 4070 or a lower-end product, they'll typically wait a few generations before upgrading. And this is exactly who this limited platform support really affects, mid-range to entry-level users, so budget users if you will. 
there's really no reason why Intel couldn't have skipped the LJ1200 socket for the 1700 socket, releasing the 10th and 11th gen on that larger socket. Imagine if those who purchased a Core i5 10600K back in 2020 were afforded the ability to upgrade to a 13600K today. And I mean without having to buy a new motherboard. And that's because based on our day one review data, the 13600K using DDR4 memory offered 50% more gaming performance when mostly CPU limited, or almost 170% more processing power for core heavy applications. That is a massive performance uplift, and had Intel been able to offer it while maintaining platform compatibility, it would have been a huge deal for them and their customers. And there's really no reason why they couldn't have done that. Therefore, it's our opinion that Intel really needs to support their next platform for at least four generations. And by generations, I mean real generations with architectural improvements, not just straight refreshes. And ideally, they need to also make a good step forward from Raptor Lake to justify the socket change in the first place, which will break compatibility. Overall, LJ1700, I think it's fair to say that it's been a bit of a mixed bag from Intel. It addressed some real problems that the company was facing, while ignoring others, and then creating some new ones. For example, the introduction of eCores helped to address the poor productivity performance of prior generations, but they've continued to ignore stuff like poor platform support, while creating new problems such as extreme power use. Of course, AMD's AM5 platform isn't without its flaws, but we're also yet to see how that one plays out, and it'll likely be a few more years before we know whether or not it's another success. Anyway, that's going to do it for this look at clock for clock performance of the KSQ LJ1700 parts. Let me know what you think of Intel's LJ1700 platform, and would you like to see Intel change tact and commit to their next platform? I know I would. Anyway, that is going to do it for this one. If you want to see more content, make sure you are subscribed, like the video, and if you'd like to get more Harbour Unbox goodness, we do have Floatplane Patreon. You can sign up for monthly live streams. That's exclusive for members only. Tim and I get together and answer your questions live and just talk about the interesting things that have been happening throughout the month. We also have a Discord server where we do much the same. Behind the scenes content and Q&A stuff. So yeah, check that out if you're interested. But if not, that is perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.